Sí, buenas noches. Good evening. Uh, good evening, authorities, speakers, architects, students. You are very welcome to the official chamber of architects of Madrid. The arrival of the Norman Foster Foundation to Madrid represents for us a very important event, not only for architecture and architects, but uh, for all citizens in the city. Now we can say that Madrid is more cosmopolitan and open-minded city than before. The Norman Foundation is a space for debate and reflection through research and global projects. Today, with this conference, we are supporting the conversation about what kind of city we want in the next future. The official chamber of architect in, of Madrid is a century old institution willing to collaborate with events like this one. It's very important for us to contribute to the diffusion of architecture among the wider society. And we are very pleased and honored uh, to uh, be here with you today. It's very well known that nowadays technology is transforming our society and is developing very, very fast. Architecture must take into account this uh, new reality and explore new links with technology in order to adapt and transform life, our lives of, uh, and uh, also our cities. So welcome again. You are at home, feel at home. We hope to continue sharing knowledge. Thank you very much. Now, Mr. Uh, Necroponte is the first speaker. <laughs> you have the stage. <laughs> Well, first of all, good evening. Um, <clears throat> my remarks, which will be about 25 minutes, uh, will be both introductory to some of the people and also to tell you a little bit about why I thought very strongly that the concept of Digital X would be appropriate, uh, not only for this seminar, but as a if you will, a point of view that comes from architecture. So to persuade you of this, I am going to show you some, some work, some of it's early, some of it's contemporary, and some is predicted. Uh, and I've called them visits to the future because I think I've been to the future. I think I've been there several times, quite a few times. And I say that not out of arrogance, but I say it because at a certain age, you realize that you used to say, in 10 years, this will happen. And then 10 years comes. And then some of it's happened, some of it hasn't. And then you say, in 10 years, this will happen. Or if it, and then you get there. And you get to the point in time that you were predicting. And you sort of get to see whether you were right or wrong, and so on. And then you look back, and you say, what did all of them have in common? And I'm going to try and share with you some examples, but with a quick story about my own background. When I was in high school, I did very well in art. I won most of the art prizes. And I also did very well in math. I managed to have what at the time was considered a perfect score in the math exams. So I went to the headmaster of my school, and I said, I do well in math, and I do well in art, and I think that I should then, therefore, study architecture. And he looked at me, and he said something I didn't understand for about almost 10 years. He said, I like gray suits, and I like pinstriped suits, but I don't like gray pinstriped suits. Whew, went right over my head, and I went to architecture school. And after doing a first and a second degree in architecture, I decided that, or realized, that the intersection of art and mathematics, for me at least, was computers. And that's why I went into computers. And this fuzzy picture on the screen 
is a display which shows beginning and end points. And this was a computer program I worked on in 1965 to automatically call automobiles to come and pick you up at one point and drop you off at the other. 1965, why did it take Uber and others so long? We're talking about 40, 50 years. Why did it take so long? And that's very important. When you want to predict or think about the future, why it took so long is not because Uber was stupid or we were stupid, but to go from this to Uber, you needed all sorts of other things to happen. You needed the GPS system, the satellites. They weren't launched until 1976. Until 1976, we really didn't know where things were because we didn't have that system. You needed to be able to display maps. You needed to have some kind of display, probably handheld device. You needed to be able to message the car, to call the car, and so on. You needed probably a little billing system so you could be charged. So all of these happened, if you will, independently. And it's like moons lining up. And so this happens and that happens. And so Uber happens because of an intersection in time. And that intersection in time is what you want to predict, not whether this program that delivered cars to phone calls and routes, but whether the constituent parts would all come together. And that's very, very interesting, to me at least, in terms of thinking about the future. I want to show you another project that dates back to 1965 as well. It was a classmate of mine who had taken two cathode ray tubes, two old-fashioned little displays, attached them to his head, had a physical connection to this device, displayed things in 3D, and when he moved his head, lo and behold, there it was. Today we call that virtual reality. And again, the reason it took 50 years is that you needed the display technology, the computation, and you can almost predict it quite, quite perfectly. You could almost pick the point in time. And the question now is, which are the ones we're doing today, the 20 years? And you will hear about some of those. I'm just going to show you two things, only because they were both ridiculed. And it was the sort of work that I was doing personally when I did work. I haven't really done work for over 30 years. I've worked on making it possible for others to do work. But when I did work, I realized I thought that touching would be a very important interface, maybe because I had studied architecture, built models, made drawings. I was, I was very tactile, and maybe it's even the art school uh, prizes. And we built displays, and people thought they were stupid. They thought they were ridiculous. Nobody's going to touch screens. They're going to get them dirty. Um, all of these sort of remarks at the time. And we built glasses. This is probably... Uh, 1978, glasses that weren't to sort of know what was coming into your eyes, but to know where you were looking, to use eyes as output devices. Everybody says, eyes as output devices? He said, yes, play a little game. Stand with somebody afterwards or tomorrow and stand four or five meters away from the person and look at them in their eyes. And then, instead of looking in their eyes, just look at the lapel, or look at their ear, or look at something a little bit to the right or the left, or up and down, and they'll know it. How do they know it? It's incredible. How can you tell someone is not looking you in the eyes? There has to be some kind of message going back and forth. You can't be computing a normal to the, to the eyeball that then does it intersect with your eye. It's not, it cannot be done that way. So as we were doing this, we suddenly realized that the best way to sort of predict the future was to invent it.
And when you're at MIT, you, you get a little overconfident and arrogant, which that statement certainly is, but it became the motto. Let's, let's just make things that have to do with the future, and then there'll be these ironies that the best interface you can have with computers is no interface. You don't have an interface with people. You, the, you assume an intelligence, you build models of them, you do all these things that now slowly computers are doing, but still it's, it's relatively explicit. So, in any talk, I've got to reference the people who are the huge influences in my life. Excuse me, it'll take two minutes, but one of them is this man, his name was Marvin Minsky, he invented the field of artificial intelligence. And he and a few colleagues went off and had a meeting in Dartmouth, at Dartmouth uh, in the late 1950s, came up with the term, which again was a very criticized term. Uh, Marvin died a couple of years ago, almost to the day, and he never got to see AI as a public interest. The fact that you can say AI, it's even, by the way, if you play Scrabble, it's an accepted word in Scrabble, AI, if you're ever stuck with those two letters. Um, so it's moved into the language. Uh, Marvin didn't think about self-driving cars. He asked himself, why do humans like music? And these, to me, were very profound questions. Why is something funny? What makes humor? And their answers, some answers, the music one doesn't have an answer, some people have answers for this, but it was again a way of thought. A second person was this man, his name was Seymour Papert, he was Marvin's partner actually in, in a lot of the work they did. He was the last person to study with Jean Piaget in Geneva, or at least be his colleague. And Seymour would ask questions like this one, or make statements like that one. And I won't read, well, I, mean, I will. You, can, you cannot think about thinking unless you think about thinking about something. And those sorts of, they're not word games, they're actually pretty deep. That one is, is, is perhaps not as deepest, but it was again a way of thought. And the last person was the person who co-founded the Media Lab with me, who happened to be the president of MIT, but more importantly, he was President Kennedy's science advisor, so he had a, a worldly as well as a scientific background. So those three people were the ones who allowed me in some sense, because I was 20 to 25 years younger than, than they were, but they allowed me to, to build a, cent a center at MIT where the creative users were the inventors, often from architecture school, often from art school, but in some cases not even from school. We have accepted people into our graduate program that didn't even go to undergraduate uh, education. So we were allowed, we built a building, we filled it up, and for 20 years, well, actually more, 30 years under sort of either my direction or more recently under somebody else's, we did projects that were crazy. If somebody didn't think that a project we were doing was somewhat nutty, then we shouldn't be doing it. Because there are very few places in the world where you can have, let's say, 30 projects and 29 of them fail. And the reason that that mathematics works at a place like the Media Lab is, in, in, in industrial terms, we have two product lines. One is the ideas and the, the sort of, but the other is people. So even if a student, in fact, if a student, quote, fails, whatever that means, um, they probably are learning a great deal. So you have this steady stream of other things. They come in today. Uh, when we started, we were three people. Today, we're 800. Um, what do they have in common? They have in common that they are all, in some way, misfits. In fact, I, t it, until recently, was the person who would write faculty, recruit, you know, you have to advertise for faculty, and in the first sentence, I used the word misfit. We want misfits, and if you can find a faculty position in a normal department, then go there. But if you can't, 
and you think you've got some important ideas, come to us. It doesn't matter what field. You can be a chemist, you can be a physicist, you can be a mathematician, you can be an art historian. Whatever it is, we want you to come as long as it is really controversial and, and edgy. So this new fa relatively new faculty member came to the Media Lab, and her work today is to produce that car out of one piece. But the piece isn't a 3D printed piece, it's a seed. Can you plant the seed and grow a car? Now, you say somebody says, oh, come on. You know, how stupid is that? Well, so was touching a screen. It was stupid, and now everybody does it. Some people, to my horror, might be doing it right now using your iPhone. Um, it, the point being is that we thought it was stupid, and it doesn't matter if you're literally making a car or it's the derivative ideas. And I'll show you one more because, or at least one in it, because Hugh Herr is one of the speakers uh, this evening, is what I call, I think it's the next slide, well, sorry, it's, it's a little dim, but it, which is not the projector, it's my slide. It's supposed to say extreme bionics. Can you really ex expand not only the physical abilities of people and get rid of, of diseases and do so on? Can, what, are the, what are the limits? And whatever the limits are, or whatever defines unlimited in both what we call, sorry, the wets and the hards, um, we're the place to do it. So let me tell you what I think is happening today, and then I'll ask, or at least I'll pose some imagine-type questions. Uh, I think that biotech is the new digital. And if I were starting the Media Lab over, if the time were happening again, that's where I would do it. And when people come to me and say, oh, I'd like to do a Media Lab at my university, well, you know, it's not 1980 anymore. The fact that it was 1980, personal computers were just invented, phone comes, companies were just being sort of privatized. Uh, there was, you know, the whole world of, 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 of media that was changing. So it blended in. Now, now I think that's where we are. So I'm going to show you four slides, the first of which is really trivial. It's the kind of thing that we asked when we started the Media Lab. And people thought there would never be a world without film. I can't tell you how many filmmakers and photographers told me that no resolution in the, in the camera, no this, no that, and I'm going to just make film because it has better resolution. And, and all these things have, have certainly changed. Now, a little harder is what would a world without nations be like, um, with one language, with only cities? I could talk to each one of those topics, particularly nations, uh, separately, but you can imagine some of it. Retail offices and suburbs, um, they're going away or changing so dramatically. I don't know any student at MIT or any student I met who wants to live in the suburbs. It just, it's unimaginable. Kent Larson, who was one of the uh, speakers this afternoon asked a class if anybody wanted to buy a car, and nobody, ha no hands went up. So ownership has changed. Now these, the next ones start to, <clears throat> to be a little bit harder, and you'll hear about the first two and maybe even the third. It's what are worlds like then, and will the the biotech sort of future change that? And I think the answer is very dramatically. So what I would like to do is take three minutes and end with sort of the project that I'm doing because I spent a lifetime making an environment for other people to do projects and I thought I should do one myself and using whatever it is, the power of convocation or the fact that people have read my book or I'm old enough for them to have been my students, <coughs> I decided I would set on a path to make connectivity a human right. Now, by that, all I want is human rights doctrine, whether it's a civic responsibility or a human right, um, is, is not quite as important to me. But the key thing is it makes it free. It's, it's more like roads, 
and sidewalks. Not that those are necessarily human rights, but it's maybe education as part of rights. The point is you think about it very, very differently. And what you have to do is think in terms of a global public sector. Think about that later when you go home tonight. The notion of public sector is very national. Public sector in Spain is one thing, and there's a public sector in France. Very little in the global public sector. Yes, the United Nations is, and you can think of a few examples, but it's, it's, not, it's not highly, you know, it's not highly uh, regarded and not sort of doesn't have momentum in as many places as it should. So if it, so isolation may not be everybody's problem, but it is the problem of a large number of people, whether they're isolated geographically, economically, or in some cases socially, other cases, maybe they have just aged and can't move. Um, there, are many, there are many forms of it. And when I think of all the forms, I would ask heads of state what their most precious natural resource was and try it sometime. And they will say things like wood or, or oil or something like that. And the answer is it's, it's, it's everybody's. It's children. That's the world's most precious natural resource. There isn't one other than that. And so if you really want to make sort of some flavor of human rights doctrine, you've got to do it for learning. And I will end with a slide which is sort of lobbying a little bit to our group. We have 10 scholars who are visiting us, and I just want to remind them and you that I think that the next 1.5 billion people is a trivial problem. And you hear a lot of famous people talking about how we're going to get the next 1.5 billion people connected to the internet. But the last 1.5 billion is a very interesting problem. And the reason I think it's interesting is that there's so many dimensions to it. They don't have power. They don't have literacy. They don't have you know, all sorts of things that you might take for granted uh, if you look at connectivity as a market versus a mission. So that's my mission, and that's my brief introduction. Thank you very much. See, but I guess next group. <laughs> yes, sir. it's self introduction, I think. Okay. So clearly you have to introduce yourselves. Are there three mics? Yes, okay. Well, hello everyone, my name is Ricky Burdett and I'm from the London School of Economics. Uh, and uh, I'm here to really learn together with um, a lot of other people, not just in this room, but those who have been at the Norman Foster Foundation for now 24 hours and will be there for the rest of the week to engage in these um, issues that Nicholas has sort of thrown out to us. Um, and to do that, um, I think I can now say properly that I'm going to introduce two fantastic misfits, right? With this word that was used earlier of people who don't necessarily sort of fall into proper categories or professional categories, which is what Nicholas was sort of being critical of. Uh, and in fact, it's not just interdisciplinary work, uh, cross-cutting work, which is uh, in many ways answering so many of the questions that you've been addressing, Nicholas, for the last sort of 30, 40 years, uh, but it's clearly where things are going to be in the future. Uh, you've heard Nicholas talk um, in a sort of very simplistic way about this place called the MIT. Well, here in Madrid, let us recognize that there are other parts in the world, and of course for Londoners it's even more difficult, but the Massachusetts Institute of Technology is the place where um, a series of ideas have been tested across, of course, the disciplines. And we have two individuals here, Kent Larson and Hugh Herr, who very much are at, uh, not only these misfits, but sort of very interested in, in, in particular things that we can just talk about in a moment. Um, Kent is uh, trained as an architect, but actually has been involved in developing at the, me at the Media Lab 
uh, effectively what is called a, a, a city science group or city science center. And those two words are very important. To actually start talking about cities in relation to science is very significant. And uh, Hugh, you're going to help me with getting the pronunciation of your center right, but it is, you say it, bio? Biomechatronics. Mechatronics, which is effectively bringing together the world of human physiology and uh, the world of, of, of um, well, technology and, and much more. In a way, we'll hear more. Now, I think what we want to do in the short time we have available is to try and just pull out some of the themes that Nicholas has touched, but really we need you to explain a little bit what you're, what you're doing before we go into some of the bigger issues. I mean, Hugh's work, I mean, you know that his um, uh, TED talk has 5.3 million viewers. That speaks for itself in terms of what uh, the, the significance of the work that he's been doing. And it's around the invention of uh, new pieces of technology which interact. And I think this is the key word. You've used some phrases which uh, I'd like you to unpack in, in a moment when we, when we get to that, about how the natural world and let's call it the design or the man-made world, actually talk to each other. And I think that's what Nicholas was also talking about, uh, not then, but also now. So maybe in a moment, Hugh, we can come to that. But Kent, can I just start with you? Um, Kent's work um, is very much about understanding the relationship between different forms of human activity, moving, um, living, uh, and occupying cities and relating that to sort of advances and asking questions, which I think Nicholas used once the phrase, what is good about Kent is that he's asking questions about problems that we don't know exist, which I think is very much part of sort of this thinking. Pull out for us, Kent, one example of your work on mobility, one on your work on architecture, and one on cities, and say why you feel they're at the interface of these sort of meta questions that are being asked today. But take us through some example, I mean, practical okay. examples so we know what you're talking about. And Hugh, I'll come to you in a moment. <coughs> well, in terms of mobility, I think we're, in, in some ways we're on a mission to get rid of cars in cities. I couldn't care less about driverless cars, I think. But autonomy is really, you know, a, a very powerful tool that we can use in the mission of reclaiming cities for people rather than machines. So we're, we're now, we worked on a whole series of prototypes. We're working on small, ultra lightweight, three wheel, autonomous bike-like vehicles that move people and goods that is somewhere between, uh, you know, the kind of stationless mobike system that you have in China now and an Uber system. And uh, yeah, so that's, uh, we're building prototypes, but we're then we're also modeling the impact of at the scale of a district in the city. So we like to build things that industry is not working on, and we like to then try to model their future impact. Um, in terms of housing, uh, I think. Oh, what are these vehicles that you design? They fold. They, what do they do? Well, I mean, we did a, we did a pro we did projects that folded because the idea was to build a vehicle that was. Uh, a good, a good neighbor, you know, a good citizen, rather. Uh, so, parking, you parking takes means? up a lot of space. What, do, what does that mean? A good, what is it? Well, I mean, cars are, uh, you know, terrible citizens in the city. They take up a huge amount of room. We have to build all this elaborate infrastructure to accommodate them that takes away from people. Uh, they separate people. They, they, I think, in a lot of ways, destroy social ties and connections, which is important in a city if you're thinking about entrepreneurship. It's all about social ties. And um, cities, particularly in Northern Europe, are you know, rapidly moving away. The question is what, from cars, the question is what replaces them. And I think it needs to be something that can coexist with humans well. So we're, we're, we're trying to work on a vehicle that can exist with pedestrians and bicycles and just get rid of cars. And I think we're... On, on architecture, I think one of the great challenges uh, in, in cities is um, the lack of equity. Um, I mean, the life, uh, lifeblood of a city is uh, the creative energy of young people and artists and uh, the, the market, it, market forces does not provide equity. In fact, I think market forces alone 
leads to dysfunctional communities. So you, you have to attack it from different directions, but the one area that we're focused on is building small spaces that function as if they're many times bigger by using architectural robotics that allows for a single space to transform in an effortless, even magical way from living to working to sleeping to entertaining, et cetera. And um, so that's an example of, of um, something we've worked on in the lab for many years and now we actually started a company and we're beginning to take it to scale and we're seeing some traction. So hopefully it will, will have some impact. We think of it as living large in a small space. Um, in terms of cities, um, I think the whole process, conventional process of urban planning is broken. And actually in, in some ways we're on a mission to get rid of um, the profession of urban planning in the design of cities. Urban design is, is great, good architecture is, is useful, but I think in terms of the, the basic bones of a city, particularly these new cities that are being built in China are, I think, completely broken. So we're trying to find a new evidence-based, data-driven process that combines um, physical models with real-time simulation, augmented reality, can bring in people that are maybe experts about a city, like a mayor, but they're non-experts when it comes to technology and di in design. So we're trying to em empower more people to engage creatively in the process in of creating sense, cities. It's very much a two-way process, isn't it? It's not just having a, a, a kit of technology which can be modified in order to suit a particular ambition, but it's also the feedback loop, which I think you, we might come to in a sec. Yeah. But the, the, well, well, when, uh, comment on this, yeah. then we can come back and perhaps to your work in, in Hamburg, I think would be interesting. Feedback. Yeah. Uh, so we're, we're uh, thinking about at the MIT Media Lab and the Center for Extreme Bionics how to link the, the built design world to the human nervous system in a bi-directional way. We want to get information into the brain and out of the brain. Um, the legs that I'm wearing uh, are not coupled to my, my muscles and nerves in a bi-directional way. Um, I can think and uh, control the motors, but when, you, when I touch here, it doesn't feel like I'm touching my hand. It doesn't feel like I'm touching skin. So we're now looking at a problem and developing paradigms of getting, uh, uh, allowing synthetic computation to actually input information into the nervous system. Um, you can use that to actuate the human, to move the human, to stimulate muscles, uh, to, to actuate the person's mood. You can also reflect sensory information from uh, a worn design construct of the nervous system. Can you give a sense, when you talk about this actually affecting the, that, this two-way dialogue, can affect the mood, can help us understand how, how does that work? Both technically, but also what does that, uh, what how are you doing that? And what examples have you got in your experimental work which give everyone in this room a sense of what that actually means because it's such an extraordinary concept really that this two-way dialogue between you you use the word hard and soft a lot uh, and I think Mary Oxman who also works uh, across uh, these different boundaries at uh, Media Lab uses that terminology of sort of t soft tissue and hard infrastructure and simplifying it enormously can you say a little bit more about how the mood is affected, the mental state. So when I, when I say actuate, you know, limbs, moving limbs or actuating mood, I, I, I mean in a direct sense. I don't mean that, you know, you give me a present and I get happy, so you actuated my mood. So, um, so there, there's a literature on uh, how one can electrically stimulate the, the vagus nerve that runs bi-directionally down, bilaterally down the neck. So we're, we're looking at uh, optically how to target uh, specific um, tuning forks, if you will, uh, molecular types uh, that impact mood. Uh, and we, we ultimately want to not only actuate mood, but have closed loop systems linking uh, one human brain to a second human brain. 
um, if our brains were linked, one dynamic interface that could be developed is if I, if I do or say something that makes you happy, there would be a feedback loop that would boost my mood. And distinction, if I were to do something or say something that would make you sad or upset you, I would get upset. And you would have the same uh, feedback loop with me. And the idea is if we were both to agree to this interface, we could develop a deeper understanding and maybe a greater empathy between us. Can you give a sense of how, in your group, who do you work with? Who, what are the specialists, the different misfits, so to speak, who help you explore these issues? I mean, I ask this also because in many ways, th this project here at the, the, at the uh, Foster Foundation is intentionally trying to recreate a sort of model of which is not the way professions are replicated, where you only have people in the same room, and I know Kent has strong views on this. Uh, uh, you don't have the same profession with the same interests um, and uh, the same sort of paradigms. Who do you work with to test these areas? You know, you know I, I think the, uh, the, the key to a highly innovative, innovative person and highly innovative center and institute and city and community is, I would say, diversity. The, the, cr the you know, the magic dust of the, of the Media Lab is, is diversity. Mm. And the Media Lab, by design, never hires uh, two uh, faculty members that think alike. The Media Lab would never say, let's be really extraordinary in computer vision. And they'd never go out and hire five computer vision people. They would hire one, perhaps, and the best person. So because of that, you have uh, roughly 30 groups, and every group is completely distinct intellectually. That's, that's significant because a lot of the interesting questions and solutions are at the interfaces or at the edges between formal disciplines. So you kind of create uh, more edges and more friction by putting a highly diverse group of people together. And Kent, taking that um, sort of model in terms of the work you're doing, let's take that to the city scale just for a moment. Where has this diversity actually worked? And perhaps you want to refer to an area that we wouldn't be thinking of talking about when it comes to the word city science, but dealing with a massive issue which affects every one of us, certainly in Europe, uh, of dealing with refugees. Right? How has your work actually, uh, in a way, intersected with different dis disciplines, di diverse ideas, but also within a context of a very real problem to solve? Which is, you know, and well, I think that <coughs> I think our work in at one on one level is exactly the same as Hugh's, even though we're in totally different domains, and I don't ha understand half of what Hugh talks about when he gets into Where the weeds. Do I understand? <laughs> but we, um, I mean, it, it starts with understanding conditions. So we use sensors and we collect data, and then it and and then we. Um, design interventions. So in architecture, we, we're using motors and actuators to alter the state. We're not you know, changing the angle of an, an ankle, but we're moving walls and beds. And, and, and there's, a, there's, there's kind of a feedback loop. Uh, you know, so we're using sensors and algorithms and, um, and interventions using you know, actuation. With uh, the project that you mentioned in Hamburg, the, we, we worked with the city to help them address their refugee crisis. It, it quickly became clear that the problem was not how to design the housing. The Germans know how to design housing. They didn't need our help. The challenge was identifying sites in the community that were acceptable to the community to build the housing. And if you put a community group in a room, you know, there would be arguments endlessly because it's a very emotional, highly charged um, problem. So we, we created a process where we would project information about uh, the available sites. We, we used little optically tagged Lego pieces that would move. Then we give them real-time feedback as to 
the pros and cons. We, we used an AI system that could suggest suggestions. And we could have easily designed it for them. I mean, we knew where to put the housing, but that wasn't the challenge. The challenge was getting the community to agree that this was a good idea. And I have to say it worked beautifully. We did 30 workshop, uh, 44 workshops with 30 people. And the, and the communities actually surprised everyone as to the willingness to accept the refugees once they, they, they had this, this you know, confidence in the kind of feedback that, that they were getting. And so they gave us the confidence to build on that and go to much more complex systems, including now a couple of new cities that we're involved with in, in China, in, El in Helsinki, where we're dealing with many, many more issues, but engaging a much broader group of people. But you, when, when you hear Kent talk about, uh, well, to a degree, a much larger scale, the city scale, even um, the scale of, uh, of a building or a, a micro unit which can have larger sort of uh, ac activities in it because of the robotics uh, element in it and the sensors that you've described in responding to sort of human needs. In terms of the work that you're doing now, you talk about in, um, in some of your lectures and papers about um, effectively looking at the relationship between design, nature, and built form. And you, you, you use that word, I think, quite a few times. Where do you say a little bit more about that? Because I'm just curious. I'm not sure what you intend by that. I'm, uh, the little I know of your work is very much around uh, the issues of um, uh, working with the human body, working with nature. How do you see this next transition, which is literally to do with scale? Yeah, a, a lot of our work we, we do design through the, the lens of science. Um, so we, I call it, you know, putting the hand in, into the cookie jar of nature. So we, uh, I call it stealing. So we, we model, we do scientific studies. We, we try to advance a deeper understanding of how humans work, how we think, how we move. And then the, that science informs what we design. So for example, the bionic limbs that I'm wearing, uh, we discovered that the, the human calf muscle is controlled by the spinal cord with a positive force feedback, which is the greater the force on the uh, calf muscle, the greater is the neural activation of the muscle. Uh, we, and then we program via the small microprocessors, control the synthetic muscle tendon in the same way. And what we discovered is by stealing from nature, um, nature's come up with very, very powerful methodologies with extraordinarily expansive emergent properties. So with a few lines of C code uh, run on a tiny little computer uh, the size of your thumbnail, uh, programming in this, this spinal reflexive ref uh, pos positive force feedback, I'm able to walk at different speeds and up or down trains. And the robots that I'm wearing do not know that I'm walking on carpet, do not know that I'm walking at different speeds or up and down hills, but nonetheless provide me the right stiffness and power as an emergent behavior. I mean, you will come back in a moment, if we may, to the built form question, but you make an interesting point in some of your talks about effectively being able to uh, take advantage of um, the technical infrastructure that you've created to actually change your height. I mean, I'm slightly simplifying some of the ones whereby if he wants to feel good and strong and in front of others, he just pushes the button, so to speak, or expresses a desire to be taller. And if he wants to feel a little bit more sort of comfortable with people, you'll sort of come down a size, right? Which is something we can't do unless we shrug our shoulders, I guess. So <laughs> say a little bit more about that. Uh, I, I always say that I'm, it's so lucky that I'm, my limbs are amputated because I can do all these fun things like adjust height. Yeah. When I was dating, if the woman was tall, I'd crank them up. If she was short, I'd crank it down. It's wonderful. And I can walk through tall grass and not worried about snakes biting me. It's so absolutely this is, wonderful. This is where there is a connection, Kent, with, with the robotic side and let's call it the amplification maybe of size, space structure, but also the amplification of experience. 
which I think is kind of what you're putting on. That's what. Is this something in your work, uh, Kent, that you're you're doing now with will built form and uh, uh, that is is going to different places? And I'm particularly interested to know how your work and generally our media lab connects to the entrepreneurial. How do you get it out there? How do you actually don't leave it within the confines of uh, academia? But I think you run a company. <laughs> you also have set up a, a company. So can you talk a little bit about, uh, let, let's call it that robotic side, how it within your architectural work of the, the sort of the minimal spaces becoming bigger and how you go out to industry and where, what are the limitations of that? Well, one, one of the frustrations when we were working in the lab, just talking about the housing work, is that if, if an architect wanted to build such a space or a developer wanted to deploy it at scale, it was really impossible. I mean, you, you, could, you could maybe do a very expensive one-off prototype, but in order to have impact in, on people's lives, you know, generally, broadly, uh, you need to have a supply chain and sweat the details to get the cost down and have installers and people to maintain it, to, you know, you know whole, do marketing, and you know we don't do any of that at MIT, nor should we. Um, at <coughs> so I think when, at the Media Lab, when an idea might have impact, we think it could have impact, uh, and, and it's ready for prime time, you either, you have two choices. You partner with an existing company or, or um, start a company. And usually that it means start a company because that, uh, I think some of the ideas we're, we're working on are too wacky to be absorbed into an existing company. I, I, I just spent decades trying to convince established companies to do something with my ideas, and I, I you know, increased the number of gray hairs <laughs> and heart tissue. Just like, you just got to start your own company in because the inventors, uh, the founders, truly believe in what they're doing. So the, the odds of success are tremendously high uh, going that pathway. I was struck by one of the points that you made, and this is now entering momentarily before we go back to the issue of design and technology, the, the, the realm of politics and ethics to a degree. I was struck by the point that you made that you wanted to take some of these I ideas of the way that you can improve people's lives, particularly people who have suffered um, the sort of experiences that you've, you've articulated about losing limbs, etc to the American national health system, let's call it that, uh, in order to say that it would be wise to actually invest money uh, and support individuals um, to get this sort of help um, because in the long run, it would actually save the government lots of money elsewhere. Now this was before Donald Trump, so I don't want to go there. And, and, and what happened to that story and how much do you feel in both your work type of work, are you able to sort of influence also, in a way, the sort of paradigm of political thinking, of ethical thinking? Yeah, I've, I've spent a number of years um, uh, trying to convince uh, CMS, the Center for Medicaid and Medicaid Services at the, in the U.S., uh, to, to cover bionic limbs. There's so many people that, that could benefit um, from Cover, such technology. To actually provide the subsidies. Correct, yeah. correct. The US um, CMS has to code and price and cover a technology. When they do, then private insurance um, follows suit. So the it's critical that uh, CMS recognize a new technology um, for, both, uh, for both the elderly and um, uh, the broader uh, insurance companies. So um, that's a very difficult process. One tries to build an economic argument. The fact that, uh, for example, this technology enables a person to walk without a limp uh, will mitigate or eliminate secondary conditions of joint uh, osteoarthritis, uh, the requirement of pain medication, surgeries. So we're building the argument that we could Technologies like this could actually reduce the overall healthcare payment across the lifetime of the patient. 
Well, we, we try to work with mayors, and I, I really like mayors. I think mayors tend to be non-ideological problem solvers that are trying to do good things for their community. In, in fact, I'd be happy if um, mayors ruled the world. A friend of mine, Ben Barber, wrote that book, which, uh, and I, I agree with much of what he said. I think as you go up to state and federal governments, it becomes increasingly dysfunctional. And I think the future of this planet, I, Nicholas you know, referred to it in his slide, is, is to have a you know, city, a, a, a world dominated by mayors. What, what I find is the mayors are open to these ideas, typically. And the young people that are involved in the cities are, are open to these ideas. It's this, uh, you know, crusty layer of bureaucracy and, you know, conservative um, companies that have captured a big part of the uh, local economy that are the problem. And, uh, but I think, there are, I think there are ways to deal with that as well. I think we should be beginning to conclude now. And I, I just want to, given that, you know, we are in a, uh, a week-long discussion about Digital X, provoked by Nicholas and uh, picked up by Norman and others at the Foundation with inputs of which we're going to hear much more uh, in, a, in a moment from uh, you know, uh, straight architecture as opposed to um, straight technology. I'm very interested how both of you don't talk a lot about technology. Right? I, I, and I think I'm right that you, you sometimes have said it's technology that's broken. It's not, it's not like we're trying to fix people or space. And you say similar things. You, you talk about the fact that actually the robotics bit is, you know, in fact, earlier you said you're the only two who talk about m motors uh, and sensors together, you know. But that, that's uh, just, just trying to deal with the thing. S can you, in a way, just give us your concluding thoughts about the technology aspect? Because I think this does link to some of Nicholas's bigger questions that he was throwing up right at the beginning. I mean, technology is certainly not the answer. You know, many people have said before, what is the question? It's much more than that. Sometimes, as we've heard him say, you know, you're dealing with issues, and I mentioned this before, which we don't even know whether you're solving a problem. We don't know whether that problem is there yet. But just your concluding thoughts on what is, how should we be looking at technology? How do you look at technology? As a, as a means to an end, I, I'm never in love with a technology. And some people, there's a you know nanotechnology or carbon nanotubes or a new artificial muscle, and they're in love with it. And they say, okay, how can we use this gizmo uh, to to solve a particular uh, problem? So it's a technology that's looking for a problem to solve. I th I think both Kent and I um, are mission focused. Um, are mission focused um, and we have a, a large bag of scientific principles and technological principles that we employ to solve big problems um, as opposed to uh, trying to find a, a technology and where it might fit in society. Yeah, I, I find myself looking backwards and forwards at the same time because I think the, I actually think the big challenge the that we're facing as a society is to create healthy, high-functioning communities. I, th I think technology, social media, the internet, with all the good it's brought, it, it has also divided us up, up into ideological tribes and echo chambers, and we see the, you know, the negative political impact of that. And so we just decided we're, we're gonna focus on face-to-face -face human interactions go back to the old values that were lost over the last uh, 100 or so year, years with respect to community, but then use all these fantastic new technologies when appropriate to help strengthen communities. And, uh, you know, so technology is one, but I, I, think, I think to do the, address the kind of things we're, we're focused on, you need, you need good technology, you need good public policy, you need good design, uh, and, and frankly, I think we need an alternative economic system that uh, <coughs> is, you can see it emerging now, you know, with, with blockchain and cryptocurrencies and new locally defined economies that can place value 
on pro-social behaviors rather than just optimizing for economic returns. So I think, I think I mean, we'll, we'll find lots of good technology, but that's not where we start. I think this is a good point to end. Um, Nicholas before talked about MIT creating an environment. I took a note down of creative users actually becoming inventors. I think what we have here is a prime example of that. And I think some of the last points you made really go back to your point about the notion of actually shifting paradigms towards something like public global governance. I mean, imagine that. And with our friends here working uh, together with this new uh, paradigm, everything will look better, even from tomorrow. Thank you very much. Uh, after um, town planning or city planning and uh, biomechanics, we come to architecture proper, which uh, is represented here by two architects who I cannot uh, describe as misfits, because I think they fit very well into their own uh, chosen uh, part of the profession, which is almost opposite, you know, although they carry the very similar scarves, uh, as Benedetta showed. Uh, in, in, in fact, uh, you know, whether Greg Lean is, uh, is a pioneer of, uh, of the digital revolution, of the first one in the 90s and continues active in it, uh, Benedetta comes from a different uh, digital uh, uh, tradition, which is the digital as the craftsman. You know, she does things with uh, her hands and, uh, and this is another way of being digital. So um, I'm going to provoke them. They, they have listened to each other's presentation, so they know how, you know how far apart they are and how close their interests sometimes may become. So um, I'm, I'm going to ask Benedetta to begin with, uh, how, how, what can you learn from this uh, digital, in the sense of Negroponte, this digital ex the new world? In, in your own, which you, you are a traditional architect which has been trained in a very traditional way. Please. I know. So, uh, in, in a sense, today, I, I have the feeling that I was invited exactly because I'm the one who knows nothing about digital. <laughs> but now you, you say that I, I'm the, let's say, the, the uh, an alphabet of the, of the company. But you, you're saying now that I know about digital in, in the sense of, Dedos, uh, di digitos, no, in the sense of, of hands, and uh, and maybe this is uh, this is true, and I I'm enjoying a lot today because uh, really I'm I'm trying to understand. I see that this world, which I see from a distance because I I cannot manage it. I don't I don't know it. It's uh, it's dealing with things uh, that are so interesting to me. Uh, as an architect, I'm uh, I'm interested in in the in the questions, in the basic questions, in how we we make a, a world where at the end we are happier. You know, it's a, this is a kind of a, of a, of a basic thing, and sometimes we don't work on that, and we don't see that this is the exact point. When we do a project, sometimes we forget that this is the the, the real thing. So uh, I, I like very much you know, to see uh, these lectures where I understand that the mind and the spirit and how uh, this tribe of humans that we are uh, is exactly the center of the investigation of the digital world. So let, let me ask you something. Besides making models and um, making drawings, do you also use digital um, 
tools in your own office? Yes, I use it through other people. Uh, <laughs> through other people who explain me and then sometimes I sit next to them. Of course, I, I use the digital um, which was provided to everybody as a kind of a telephone and and uh, and uh, of course uh, we are all educated by the tools that we were given even if we d don't want <laughs> so of course, uh, the uh, Gre greg as, as i was saying before was one of the leaders of the first digital revolution and of course i suppose he also experienced the you know when the dot com uh, bubble sort of exploded in the first years of the millennia this kind of um, disappointment that led so many young people back towards the graphs and to say, you know, uh, trying to look for a different, uh, for a different way. Did, did you feel it in your own uh, biographical experience? Um, I feel like an old guy when you say the first revolution. <laughs> so I'll talk like an older guy, which is something I'm having to do more and more. But I think. When I look back at disappointments, um, my biggest disappointment is that I lacked a little bit of conviction in the 90s when talking about the impact of digital, primarily tools, but a digital sensibility on architecture in the sense that a lot of people would say, nobody's going to ever sketch with a computer. Nobody's ever going to get rid of drawings. We're always gonna have to have drawings on the job site. Our contractors will never understand digital files. And I actually thought that bought me some time to be a little bit more of a researcher. And it happened so fast, I had no idea. I mean, I remember, I don't even know what he's doing anymore, but Peter Pran started taking over offices all over the country and these big stadiums were being done all over the US and we were kind of all looking at them and saying, that kind of looks like something we want to do. And the mainstream practice was so hungry for efficiency in the production of drawings that the digital just so fast, so fast. And, and I, I now see that it's moving even faster and, and I feel very frightened for architecture because not, I would say my generation, people in their late 40s, early 50s, um, they're actually leaving their practices and they're working for developers. And you sit down at a meeting now and you're talking all to architects, but they're all on the other side of the table. <laughs> and they're all talking to you about different things. And, and frankly, sometimes you wanna be on the other side of that table because what they're talking about is modeling the whole logistic process of construction, looking at how augmented reality is gonna change the job site, figuring out how to have no drawings at all. Um, they're, they're, they're using these things as tools, not really as a sensibility and not maybe so much culturally and civically, but it's really moving faster than it was moving in the 90s. And, and that keeps me awake at night because I, I know what happened in the 90s thinking I had some time and, and as I see how fast it's moving now, it's, it's a really great time to be an architect. I tell young students, you're more employable now, you make a great living, you have a great lifestyle, you're needed in every possible way, and you, the opportunities are bigger than they've ever been, but things are moving really fast. It's so fast that um, we do not yet have, say, a style, or a shape of uh, forms that we can identify with yeah. parametricism. In the 90s, we knew that uh, parametricism led to bubbles and, uh, you know, and, and um, blobs. But right now, we do not know what, where this is leading. No, but I mean, you, you see that Google was trying to build 10% of Toronto. Yeah. And that, you know, most of those people are my students. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, there are, uh, there are a lot of young people doing that. I mean, do they know what they're doing? You know, frankly, no. <laughs> but, but it's really interesting they're trying to do it. And they're talking to everybody. I mean, they're crawling all over the media lab. They're crawling all over architecture offices. They're, they're really trying to figure out some very big problems. Um, and, and I would say there are architects involved, certainly. But they're a step below trying to teach 
some digital tools to be smarter than architects. And a lot of those digital tools, are they're very interesting. I mean, the things that technology is starting to discover is not something that I would consider yet part of my intuition. And, and I think it should be. I think architects need to know the digital well enough that they're working with it intuitively so they can do different things with it, let's say. The same way we've done with drawing. Mm -hmm. In your own training, did you, do you draw? Do you make models? Yep. You know, did you use your hands? Sure. And, um, and, and do you find that this is something that can still be pertinent today? Absolutely. No, I think things are more tactile and material by the year. And, and I mean, it, you can ask the poor CCA who just received my archive. It's like a nightmare. So many models at such a big scale with such high frequency, but you know, because we have laser cutters and CNC mills and all kinds of things like that that help us study and mock up. And, and now more and more electrical devices that are helping us look at how things move and transform and, and also bring heat and cooling and energy to people. Um, no, I think now, I mean, we have a couple of full-time electrical engineers in my architecture office, but then we have like 40 of them in our mobility office. And those kinds of people in the mix talking about the environment, it's crazy interesting. What do you mean by your mobility office? So we, uh, Jeffrey Schnapp and I with Piaggio started a company to look at human mobility and to look at autonomy at a scale smaller than automobiles with a company that builds scooters and and, and motorcycles and some three-wheel lightweight trucks. And just in two years, we, we have a, a product that we're bringing to market, not, not for delivery, but actually, and not as a vehicle, but as something to help people move more and carry things and help them be more mobile. Um, and, and that space is a very interesting space to be in as an architect because our approach isn't so much um, what they call pain points in Silicon Valley, like finding a small problem, like getting the pizza from the car through the window to the teenager. <laughs> like that's a pain point that I can give you five companies are working on that. We're trying to get the teenager off the couch to go get the pizza and then go do something with their friends. Or even better, get a group of people to go get the pizza. So. That's, that's uh, only an architect would think about that. An engineer would think more about how to get the pizza through the window. I see. <laughs> we would think more how to get the people at the pizzeria. Did I understand you well? Or you said that uh, you have already given your archive to an institution? Yeah, I wanted to get rid of it. Really? So, but you are very young. Are, are you doing the same? Are you already uh, locating your archive in the foundation? Or not? The archives. No, I, I, I ask this because, you know, as, as you know, Norman Forces Foundation has established its archive here in Madrid with the, the drawings, the models, you know, m many things which will be useful as future reference. So I'm asking about your, your own archives. Well, I, I, we did a kind of a foundation called the Eric Miralles in order to, to remember mainly, mainly uh, Eric, which I think was a special architect. And, but I, I, I realize having archives is, uh, is also about uh, moving ideas. Uh, so what, uh, what uh, Norman does with his foundation about keeping the archives, but the archives means having people coming and learning. It's a, it's a, it's a wonderful, wonderful way of keeping archives, <laughs> moving them <laughs> and moving ideas around them. Otherwise they are just in a kind of a file. So, but if you ask Mirko or Giovanna or Phyllis, I'm like a troublemaker because they, to support me, acquired a project, the Embryological House. And I very innocently said, would you like the digital archive? <laughs> and they said, sure, we want everything. And they took it. And then they said, well, what are we going to do with all these files? <laughs> and they were all on Silicon Graphics machines with software that didn't exist for the last 10 years. and they've decided to focus on 
Central have one of their focuses on saving digital material. So mostly what, what I've said that I wanted to give them is the digital because frankly, if, if every year that it was sitting with me, it was becoming destroyed. You know, because we move a server, because somebody reorganizes folders and you lose all the links. It's really, really dangerous to have native digital files in the hands of architects. <laughs> so, um, I believe it, I believe it. <laughs> so it's, we take terrible care of the digital files. Mm -hmm. So much, we focus models and drawings are well preserved, but the digital, so to provoke the CCA, that happened and, and I've just said, please, if you want it, it's yours. So it's all free, um, but, but really it's, it's more to make trouble for them because they can try different things, like how do you open a file for a CNC bill from 1995? And it's, it's very useful what they're doing for all architects. Now, now in, in relation to archives, uh, I realize that sometimes when you look for something in, uh, in internet, in Google, you find it quicker than in your own archive, your own projects. <laughs> we work like this. <laughs> you know the project. <laughs> It's so quick. And I have to say, your lecture was so fantastic to me, really. Now I would like to, to, to be near Greg and understand more. Because I see that he, he does this work with uh, interacting, you no, know, interacting with uh, elements, with the nature, with the sea, with the winds, with uh, how people is moving, with the fluxes of... And, and with things that we don't notice, no? which is, is so incredible. I was very, very impressed by the, uh, the luggage dog. <laughs> In a way, I love my dog. And he's very lazy. He's always behind me when I walk. And you did a project which is like that. But you have a dog which is digital and is following you in this kind of intuitive way and escaping other people, moving in the, in the, in the confusion of reality. It's, uh, this is really a fantastic, fantastic possibility. So, so Benazetta, of course, uh, Greg is a practitioner, but also a theoretician. And he has established many of the theoretical bases of um, the digital world like Negroponte uh, before. And what did you learn listening to him, besides loving the dog? <laughs> well, I learned that, for example, this kind of strange drawings that we were very often doing, where in the architecture there was uh, uh, lines which were maybe the, uh, the, the movements of the people that we were imagining inside. Uh, this is... Uh, this is becoming real, no? This is maybe the, the base of a study, how people move in a room, and maybe this is more important, no? And it's becoming really part of this new phase of architecture, no? Uh, energies, uh, fluxes, uh, all this, uh, these things, and, and this uh, invisible relationships. So I think this, this is really becoming a, a, a beautiful uh, new field of studying. And I, I'm, I'm interested in, in all of this, you know, how people uh, move, unite, uh, uh, and, and I see that this is also a, a very important base for, for these experiments that Gregor is doing. But, but Greg, um, I, I sometimes wonder whether there is an interface between, uh, you know, the world of Benedetta and yours. When you look at her work, which is so well, it is tactile, you said that tactile is coming back, but of course it's lyrical, it's, uh, but very archaic in many things. Th this, this choreographic work, you know, y you work like uh, an, an architect in the uh, Vienna Werkstatt. Uh, so, so what you do? This is a compliment. You're really incredible to be an archaic architect. I, I love it, really. <laughs> oh, no, what I mean to say I is would that love. Uh, the, the work you do could be done 100 years ago. Oh, maybe and, uh, thousands, and, even and better. Uh, yes, I know. No, and, and what I wonder is, Greg, do you see this as something which is completely passé, something which uh, is difficult to, you know, to spark your interest because you are, you know, in the future. I, I, I think like uh, like Nicholas Necroponte, you've been in the future, <laughs> and and perhaps Benedetta lives in the past. Oh, no, no, I think I'm I'm provoking. I know you are. No, but the. The work, the 
that Benedetta showed to realize the vision, and the vision had a digital component, it had a drawing component, it had a physical model component. Um, that, in a certain way, is a problem that, say, Corbusier didn't really have. I mean, you could do a few drawings and find some good builders, invent some technologies. I mean, there are plenty of technologies Corbu invented, but the, the scope of what was on you for building the woven pavilion was incredible, a huge scope. Now, um, I think the responsibility for that scope is because of the digital. I think 15 years ago, that would have been on somebody else to figure out how to do the weaving, how to unfold all the surfaces, how to roll all the steel, how to document all of that. You could have given somebody a sketch. Um, but, but I think you are dealing with what's the new digital ecology right now. I mean, sure, if you ask me, I would probably introduce you to a robot that would help you with I a lot of that. I think <laughs> I would love it. I, I think I would like that. But I would ask the, something to the robot. In a way, I think what is really interesting is to uh, achieve or, yeah, achieve a, a, a world and an architecture which, uh, which is uh, felt near to us, no? which makes us feel uh, better because we, we feel we belong to it. We, we are at, at ease in, in the space. So I think this is something that maybe you could, uh, you could uh, investigate and with the robots and with, uh, with the digital world. And, and of course, what, maybe what is difficult is to know what inputs put inside. <laughs> uh, also, I mean, not to sound old again, but being a father, and seeing, you know, saying the things that a parent says, like, could we all just get together and watch a television show as a family? Like, I remember my parents saying, could we just turn off the television and have dinner? Mm -hmm. Now I'm saying, could everyone please stop looking at their own devices mm -hmm. and just focus on the show? <laughs> um, and, and so part of what I want to do is be able to just drive my furniture into my kids or turn my house upside down and dump them so they'll stop focusing on the screen. And I, I think that relationship to the built environment is a little bit up in the air and maybe not so healthy how much time people walk around in cities like this. It's, it's, it's less in Madrid, actually, than anywhere I've been recently. I notice a lot of people actually have their heads up <laughs> rather than their heads down like in New York. Um, but, but I think that's a job for architects and urban designers and lots of people. But I do think it's our job to make the physical environment as interactive as an iPhone. And, and that's a challenge. But I, I think Apple's not going to worry about that challenge. They, <laughs> they'd like to make cars drive themselves so you can spend more time with the screen. Um, and I think it's our job to figure out how to tip some people over a little bit and make them pay more attention to the physical environment. Actually, your, your project of the house, which is moving and twisting, I was uh, really enjoying because I was imagining my, my uh, a fantastic way to wake up my son. That's <laughs> you, you, twist, uh, you twist the house and then <laughs> this is really, really fantastic. <laughs> Greg, t tell me something. Wh why do you think architects have been so prominent in the digital revolution? Because there are many architects that somehow, you know, have been um, uh, leaders or, or pioneers in many fields. Uh, why so? Because I, I think that it's a, architecture is a, a fertile place for digital. It always has been, and it is more now than it ever has been. And and frankly, as Microsoft with the HoloLens now pays attention to the built environment. As Google is now turning to the built environment, it's a it's an interesting time to be in because there are some very large organizations that are suddenly focusing on our jobs, um, or not our jobs, our responsibilities. But but up until this point, I think architecture has very comfortably been in a very nice position in the digital ecology. Um, and a lot because of pioneers, many of them were coming from architecture. Yeah, which is you know. quite extraordinary. But like In Richard Saul Werman and others, even intellectually, people were coming from architecture to figure out the discourse as well, not just the, the environment.
No, I, I was, um, I must say I was delighted that both of you uh, refer to our greatest uh, natural resource, children, your own children. And uh, <clears throat> I think we must uh, move on, <clears throat> but simply uh, remember what you ask our Madrileans to do and uh, others that uh, simply has their faces up instead of looking down on a screen as a way of uh, relating to the built environment in, in a way which is, uh, let's say, architectural. Even if practiced uh, in such a different way as uh, Greg Lynn and Benedetta Gabuya. Thank you both of you. Thank you. Buenas tardes. Good evening. My name is Jonathan Glancy. I'm an English writer and critic. Um, I thought it's very appropriate this evening. We're talking about the future. And about an hour and a half ago, we walked in out of the city into, I hope I'm not insulting the architects here, into a cave. I see you dimly as if we've gone back 10,000 years. And you're sitting there in the gloom in this cave. Um, now, Madrid, long before it became um, a great city in the 16th century, um, was inhabited by Stone Age dwellers. They were probably just here to suit the Mundred. Um, on Sunday, and this will connect to the Sunday when I arrived to join the project here at the, at the Norman Foster Foundation, I walked for three hours around Madrid and did my 20,000 digital steps. And it was an interesting walk because whilst I walked, I saw, what did I see? I saw Baroque churches, Gothic cathedrals. I saw Art Nouveau palace. I saw um, an art, de uh, art deco theater. I saw modern buildings. I saw strange digital buildings, as it were. I saw this rich pattern of a city that's existed over roughly, say, a thousand years and became a great city 500 years ago or so. Um, and what intrigued me was this. All those delights, all those special buildings, all those magnificent things I saw and walked into by serendipity. I just walked into buildings I didn't know. I've only been to Madrid a few times. Um, I thought the creativity, the magic that architects have had over a thousand years, has that ever been beaten? Have you ever beaten yourselves in terms of, have you ever triumphed over previous generations? The answer is no. Um, I'm saying the answer is no because I think it is. Um, it's just different. And what I want to do here this evening in this short slot is to talk to two very distinguished British architects who you will certainly know here, Norman Foster of course, whose own practice, Foster Associates and our Fostering Partners, has been going half a century. Last year, wasn't it, Norman? Half a century. I mean, a big picture here, a lot of buildings, and Amanda Levitt, who, uh, Amanda Levitt Architects, who produces beautiful buildings today, and beautiful is an important word, which we'll come to, and who used to be a partner of, appropriately given this evening, future systems. Always someone that's thought about the future. But I, going back to what I started with, I go straight to Norman. Le Cabusier gave us the little dictum, architectural revolution. And now we're constantly told, we tell ourselves, don't we, the digital revolution. Norman, given what architects have been able to do over a thousand years, given what you've been able to do over half a century, where, how, where and how has that revolution, if it's such a thing, the digital revolution, impacted on your work? I teeter between uh, two views. 
Um, and for a long time now, I've said, you know, I've seen so many revolutions in terms of how you draw, how you print, how you simulate, how you model. Um, and um, and that, that leads me to say the whole digital revolution is not a revolution in the sense that it's going to change architecture. It's another tool. It's a more sophisticated tool. Uh, it gives you the ability to explore many options, to see viewpoints instantly, which would be painstakingly long uh, process. But I think I'm moving to the point where I'm seeing things capable of being achieved at a heroic scale um, where the very large building approaches the infrastructure of a city uh, and, and I can now see the prospect, although it's difficult to rationalize, of saying you couldn't have done that before the digital revolution, the means that we now have at our disposal. But you're talking of... But I'm talking of... Tool, right? I'm talking of... Yes. But it's still a tool, I agree. Um, but it, I think it's, it has the power to move us from a concept of pre prefabrication where we were multiplying modules of uh, identical size, repetition, where you can now create structures because the material doesn't know the difference whether it's X centimeters or Y centimeters. So I think it has the potential to create a new level of richness and off use word this evening, but appropriate diversity. Can you give us an example? I mean, if you go back 40 years, this is not the example, but 40 years ago, your practice designed a very elegant building in Norwich in England, the Sainsbury Centre for Visual Arts, which looks like a very superior air hangar in one way. It also looks like a building of a, a kind of digital future that didn't quite exist then. And compare it to, and give us an example of a building now that uses this tool in the way you've described extensively and that you couldn't have done the building without it. Um, if I take, you use the Sainsbury Centre, the Sainsbury Centre turned a conventional building almost upside down so that it freed the roof up to be able to bring in natural light. And the aim was to create a beautiful setting for works of art. That led to the Sainsbury Centre, which was using um, all the same elements in the airport that existed at the moment. At that time, in the 1990s, the airport was the equivalent of something like this, essentially a black box with lots of lights, pulsating machinery on the top, throbbing away, um, and pretty scary. So simultaneously seeking to create a more beautiful airport, diffused, informed by natural light, by the changing quality, to introduce a level of poetry, but at the same time, perhaps in an environment where if you said to an airport manager, I'm trying to create something beautiful, he'd probably say, I can't afford it. Um, but if you argue along the lines that, well, it'll use less energy. Um, and everything is below, so you can service this 365 days a year, and you don't have to get on ladders, and the roof is maintenance-free because all the equipment is below, out of sight. What you're really saying is, I'm trying to create something beautiful, but I'm justifying it economically. Now, that airport was, it changed the way that people thought about airports, and everybody copied it in wonderful, many, many versions. 
But essentially, it's a horizontal roof, vertical walls, and it's a separate piece of appendage that connects that building to the aircraft. Now, breaking that mold with a relatively recent competition, Mexico Airport, where to move to heroically much bigger spans from 35 meters to 160 meters with no columns and everything one continuous skin where the columns become funnels and it's one curvilinear flowing space. It's interesting, anticipating this evening, I was saying, could we do that in an age before digital? And I've argued that when you look at what um, you know, uh, Gaudi did in an age before the computers, but I think that the, the task would be so awesome, you just couldn't do it. So I think that I'm seeing a threshold reached where we have the capability of creating forms and using materials more economically, more beautifully, and exploring many, many options. So this building will be the first lead platinum airport. So it's not just the quest for beauty, it's the quest for something that will use less energy and will be more sustainable. And so it's a more holistic way of working. So I'm very optimistic, but I'm... I, Hey, we, we taken too long. No, Norman, Amanda, Amanda, Norman almost, almost rushed over a phrase, introducing a sense of poetry, which was lovely to hear. Um, you and your team have designed a very elegant new museum in Lisbon on the River Tagus. Um, it's a building that flows very nicely, very elegantly, very convincingly into the urban landscape, bringing a piece of urban wasteland, as it were, back to life. That building, I know, has a, a key digital element to it, but which you, I know, <laughs> which I want you to describe because it's so interesting. But it's an element that uses digital technology to create this poetry that won't be lost, I don't think, in this new digital world if architects continu continually use their imagination and all their old senses. I mean, could you talk us through that? I, I think the first thing to say is that the, the, the big, for, for me, digital is, is a tool. It's never a, a generator. And I think that we have the, the choice to use it and when to use it. And we don't always use it. Um, in the case of the museum in Lisbon, the real driver was purely the geography. First of all, how, do you, how can you use the design of a building to help reconcile a city whose center is cut off from the waterfront? Um, and then how do you use this extraordinary south-facing building in the westernmost part of Europe, how do you, which has the most incredible light, and when the light hits the water, it, it's as if it's on fire. How can you create a, a facade to a building that will amplify that? And so, so we, in, in trying to, to reconcile the, the, the disconnect between the city and um, the waterfront, we designed the building, we, we kind of lowered it so that we could create a bridge from over the railway tracks, completely level bridge, so it's totally accessible for everyone. And you would land on the roof of the building and then take a, a, a ramp down. So, and, and then there's a kind of metaphorical connection where you can be on the roof and look back towards the city. But how we, how we use the digital was, we became very obsessed with ceramics and ceramics are, you know, extraordinary tradition here uh, and in um, Portugal. How could we, in this very long facade, how could we break it up and create the maximum surface area that would create the maximum variety of reflections when the light hits the water and bounces off onto this facade? 
Um, and we did use digital technology. I mean, it's, you know, script writing, it's not, you know, it's not exactly at the, the cutting edge, but we used it in order to create this surface, which then gives it a very, a texture that is very human, that is um, animated by light. And then we applied to the, um, the glaze a, a, a crackle, because that speaks of a very, um, you know, something very ancient. And actually, crackle glaze was the result of an accident in the kiln in the Song Dynasty in the 13th century. And I've been thinking about that a lot because with the automation of so much, that accident, that batch of glaze, would, through automation, would just be discarded and the thing of beauty would have been lost forever. So how can we, you know, I'm just interested in this sort of, this point that we can use technology to help us resolve the kind of eternal tension between integrity, function, and beauty. Norman, is there a building the practice has done, Foster and Partners, that is, you could label digital, sort of digitally led, because I don't, I, I don't think there is, by the way. But no, you, I, I, I mean, I, I agree with, with Amanda. I mean, uh, we inhabit uh, a building which is clad in cedar, uh, large uh, shingles, um, uh, and which has the equivalent, if you like, of the crackle that you describe in that it changes according to the weather over the years. So the top of it where it's been burnt by the sun and saturated by the rain is inky black and the underside of the building is the same beautiful golden hue that it was when it was, was first built. That cladding um, uh, is wrapped around a structure of high technology timber which was cut by uh, cutters uh, programmed directly from the computers. Um, uh, but it is a means to an end um, in that sense. It's not, it's not a generator. It may enable the creation of forms and so on, which would be beyond the capability given. But if you had, I guess, infinite time, infinite resources, you probably could get there, but uh, you'd, never, you'd never have the time to be able to do it. You'd never be able to explore all those options. But, you know, in, in, uh, I think there's no end to human ingenuity. I mean, you and I talked about the, uh, the marvel of Concord, which was an analog product with analog instruments of extraordinary beauty and, uh, and tens of thousands of parts, all fully resolved, worked out with slide rules um, mm. and drawn on paper in metric measurements and imperial measurements with an Anglo-French team. And yet it all resolved into this thing of beauty. And I just, I, can I push you both on this? Um, Norman first, what the architect's given over the centuries is why I started the way I did, not just to say I think I'm in a cave at the moment, but it's, architects have created extraordinarily complex things, whether it's Gothic vaulting, fan vaulting in England, think of that, and who created that? It looks like it might be done today, you know, on a kind of parametric modeling or with um, algorithms at work to create it, it certainly wasn't. It was done by people who had, what, bits of paper at best. I mean, I, I, I think some of the things that we've been hearing today suggest the the creative power in the future of the computer, but I remain uh, skeptical about that. I mean, I'm reassured by uh, a history of extraordinarily beautiful buildings over the centuries, um, which have come out of uh, a relative, in relative terms, you know, crude analog uh, world. Um, uh, Amanda, I, I think, probably an, another very beautiful building that you did, which is the, um, the Victorian Albert uh, galleries. 
similarly uses ceramics in terms of the whole floor scope with extraordinary variety, which I suspect uh, there's a digital input there, which I... Yeah, I mean, there, there, there was. It's, it's interesting that the, that the big idea that drove that project at both the kind of micro level of the courtyard, but also the macro level, was um, because there was a, a kind of built-in paradox to that project, which is the big event, the big gallery, is below ground. You can't see it. And this paradox, for me, it was, you know, how do we make visible the visible? And that's quite a poetic notion. And the, the courtyard became a way of doing that. And we took the very complex three-dimensional structure of the gallery ceiling, which spans 38 meters, and we flattened it, and we took from that a um, digital pattern that reflected the, um, the rise and fall of the, the folded plate. And it, as a two-dimensional surface, it became the setting out pattern for the tiles, and, and it picked up other geometrical complexities. And I hope that in some way there is, and it's interesting that you kind of intuitively think that there, it came from that, that there will be a sort of understanding that somehow this pattern reflects the complexity uh, of, um, of what is below. But I think, you know, going back to history, you know, Borromini, Br Brunelleschi, that they had a, a, an intuitive parametric understanding. I mean, parametrics isn't like, you know, you alter one thing and something else changes. It's, it's not, so I think it's, uh, of course, it's, what we can do now is extraordinary, and I know that you can convert anything into an algorithm, but you can't convert what you don't know. And I, I'll just illustrate this. Um, wh when I start on a project, whether it's a competition or a commission, I like to read around the subject. And we were working on a, a recent competition, actually, normally we're doing the same, for a, a concert hall for the LSO in London. And I was reading a book about the rebuilding of La Fenice, the opera house in Venice. And there were lots of things I could have taken away from reading that book, but there was one thing that just obsessed me. And it was the story of a craftsman who went into the burnt out shell of the building to retrieve some of the wooden carvings. And he picked up a carved angel and he said, you know, this wasn't here just for decoration. This was here to make sure you never felt alone in the room. And I thought, my God, if we can capture that notion, if we can find a way of making physical that idea, and then, of course, we didn't win the competition, so we haven't actually realized it, but my hunch was that we would do that through scripting, through a, a kind of a, 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 a digital way of looking at texture, of pattern making, of, of you know, lines, so that your eye could fall on something that you would never feel alone. It's, it, it, it's a beautiful thought, and it's interesting. Uh, you mentioned the great Baroque architects. Um, just another, four years ago, I was talking to Zaha Hadid, sadly no longer with us, and said, Zaha, your buildings um, are becoming increasingly Baroque. And it's your parametric Baroque. Well, she cackled with laughter as she did that. Great, extraordinary laughter. <laughs> and then she says, yes, you're right. She says, of course, all Baroque. She says, my, my business partner, partner practice, Patrick, he, he will give you the parametric theory of today and push it further. He's the digital man. She says, you're probably right, I'm becoming Baroque, she says, I'm getting <laughs> old, crazy. She says, she's a funny woman, but you know, brilliant architect, you know. Um, but it's what she was trying to say, of course, was she knew her history inside out, too, and had an intuitive sense of it as well, that for all this complex computer power at their fingertips, they weren't they weren't overtaking those block masters. It's not what she's trying to say. It's not a competition, all this, is it? I mean, I, but they were doing these extraordinarily beautiful things. And I, I just seems to come back to that thing again. I'd like, perhaps Norman, come back to this thing about the tool. If the, the architect sees, you've said, you've seen revolutions, you see them come and go, 
And if you live long enough and keep working for long enough, yeah, you, re- you come through them, don't you? And you, the futures slip by. Futures become the past remarkably quickly. Um, and But architecture has a much longer life than that, doesn't it? Whatever you're trying to do, we, we will still want the architect, you know, thinking, imagining, dreaming, and with that sense of poetry. I mean, that won't, you don't want that to go, do you not, don't you? I'm, I'm sure that uh, a similar conversation could be taking place in the 19th century with Brunel, who created the most extraordinary infrastructure of railway lines, where the curves anticipated the high-speed trains of, uh, of later uh, centuries, um, uh, and um, and he, with his in the Brunel Museum, I gather, which I haven't visited, but has his drawing instruments and the collection of curves with which he would be drawing lines, probably with a ruling pen. And I can remember the ruling pen, and I can remember the revolution of the graphos pen, which uh, had a series of nibs instead of turning a knurled knob and this pair of tweezers which would vary the width of the ink line and repeatographs and revolution after revolution. Um, uh, But I think uh, going back to that Baroque past which was wonderful curvilinear flowing spaces, um, I mean in the end uh, all these tools are as good as the people who are who are powering them, whether it's pushing a pencil, whether it's programming a computer. Um, um, and um, you know, maybe at, at some point I'll say uh, that is something which is so much more beautiful than ev- anything I've ever seen in the history of architecture, and that's truly the result of, uh, of, of digital. Um, maybe I'll live long enough to see and say that or not. I don't know. Amanda? Um, I I was really heartened um, by listening to to Hugh and Kent and how you talked about it's all about the mission. And maybe I didn't expect you to say that. And I was so, so glad you did because I think that's, that's what we're saying. You know, it's you have to understand why you're doing something. Uh, I just want to tell a story. It's not architecture, but I was recently in Kuala Lumpur at a conference and I met this very young, brilliant Malaysian rocket science and he'd given a talk and everyone was just bowled over because he was going to send a rocket to the moon. And I sat next to him at dinner and I said, you know, it's amazing, amazing what you're doing, but why are you doing it? And he said, oh, I'm doing it because... I want to provide free internet connection to the poorest and most remote communities in the world forever without the cost of infrastructure. And I said, but how could you have forgotten to say that? And he was, he was so enthralled to the technological advances that he was making that he had forgotten to mention why he was doing it. <laughs> <Okay>. <coughs> Yeah, I mean, you remind me, really, of uh, the start to this um, workshop, uh, Digital uh, X, um, and, um, and the opening of that was, um, was Hugh um, talking about the transformative power of technology as a means to social ends in terms of mobility, life expectancy, and its power in a foreseeable short term to totally transform the nature of a human being for good with, as he explained, all the attendant risks and question marks along there. And I think I have to say that if that has such transformative power for good in that field, 
then just maybe you really could see a revolution in architecture, which is beyond my comprehension. That's a very, very good place to stop that because we, we uh, from this workshop too, we still hope and we're, in everyone involved is excited that the unexpected will keep leaping out at us. And so when in the end we will produce some sort of summary publication of this, the great thing is we don't know what that publication is. We don't know what it looks like, what it's gonna say. It's more, <laughs> more responsibility there, thanks. Well, I mean, but it's nice sometimes, isn't it, not to know. But what we do know, and that takes us right back to walking through this great city, is that even if we become bionic people, even if we run at 60, I said, you know, say miles an hour, sorry, I just say kilometers an hour, shouldn't I? But even if we fly, we develop wings and fly, and the things Hugh talked about were so exciting this morning, um, thrilled everybody, we will still somehow slow down and want to be in spaces that inspire us. Um, digital or not, architects, we want them to continue to do that. Thanks very much indeed. <laughs> Thank you very much, ladies and gentlemen. We're going to stop. Any less? Thank you. Thank you.